Hello there. Hi. Today, I know Lynn and I are having a little chat. Um, Lynn, I want to thank you for doing this with me. I know that it is not always the most comfortable thing to do to sit down and share your experiences. Um, but we both agree why it's important. We both are very much alike in thinking, let's show others what's possible, right? Yep. Yep. It, hope. Something we so often lose as we're going through breast cancer, inspiration, motivation, right? To get up and start doing things again. So we're going to kick things off today. And I'm going to ask you to share a little bit, as much as you're comfortable sharing, about you and your breast cancer story. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see. It started in December of 20. 21. And um, I was just putting on lotion. And I'm like, Oh, this side doesn't feel the same as this side. And it kind of went through my head like, no. And then you know, the holidays came and I kind of just brushed it off. And then in February every year, I usually do a mammogram. So I called them up to schedule just a normal screening. And the one question she asked me was like, oh gosh, she asked if I had any lumps. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I do. And that was ugh, the really the beginning of reality, really. Um, they said that I would need, you know, a special mammogram and probably have an ultrasound, which is exactly what happened. And then I had biopsy and that wasn't very fun. And um, <clears throat> I guess all along, I kind of, knew what was coming but I sort of didn't want to believe it uh but it was true they they called me on March 16th of 2022 Ugh. <clears throat> and I just remember this sweet person calling me telling me that it was positive and my husband was you know had his arm around me because we were both there together to get the call and it was strange. Um, I don't think I cried. I just was in shock. Like, wow, this is really happening. And then, you know, you start going through ugh, thousands of appointments, thousands of tests, thousands of this, thousands of that. And you're just like almost a robot going through whatever they say. I was really fortunate to have an amazing breast surgeon. I love her to death. Um, she was, she saw me freak out. She saw me cry. She saw me smiling. Cause we kind of went through this. Cause at first it was so small, you know, that, um, it was so small. We just thought it was going to be a lump lumpectomy. And I'm like, okay, I can do this. Well, then they do the genetic testing. And I like you, Karen, are BRCA2. I had never even heard of that. And so when my doctor was trying to explain <clears throat> to me what that month, what, what that meant, ugh, immediately I started thinking of my kids, right? I didn't care about me. I was worried about them. And I just remember freaking out in her office. And my husband was so sweet. He was holding my hand. And that was probably the scariest, not even having breast cancer, just realizing that I could pass down this horrible gene to my kids and they could do it on and on and on. So um, let me just she, hold that for a second. No, because yeah. I'm curious if there was a family history of breast cancer, because there wasn't for me with, you know, in, in getting my diagnosis. So I was super grateful that they did the genetic testing. Yep. Yep. Um, so I'm curious for you if, if there was a family history. I was not aware of one, but I have found out since then that a couple of my cousins on my dad's side, a couple of my aunts, had it um but we're from upstate new york and now i live in tennessee and so we sort of didn't stay in touch with that side of the family a whole lot and so i wasn't aware of all of it and um <clears throat> since then we found there's a lot of cancer on my dad's side my both my parents passed away with cancer but it was different things so i kind of always knew that might be my destiny at some point when i'm 95 or something <laughs> but 
yeah, I wasn't aware of it, but I was really grateful. Now I am. Now I am. I wasn't initially that I found out about it. Um, but Karen, I kept saying to myself, good things will come out of this. Good things will come out of this. Good things will come out of this. And I kept waiting and waiting. And obviously good things have, but that's the end of the story. Um, so, you know, they, they, the doctor just said, you are, you can do a lumpectomy if you want. It's completely your choice, but I do recommend a bilateral mastectomy. So me being the medical professional that I'm not, I said, what is a bilateral mastectomy? <laughs> and um, she said like that. a means, whole other language oh, I do. you have to learn. Yeah, <laughs> yes, it, it is. Yeah. And when she said both breasts come off, I'm like, oh my gosh. And that was scary. So she gave me all the time I needed. Um, she explained, you know, the procedure and, and I felt really well informed between a lumpectomy and a double mastectomy. And so I just kept praying about it and thinking about it and talking to Bill. And of course he was like, whatever you decide, I'm behind you. So I had him on my shoulder the whole time. <clears throat> Never had pressure ever, which was a blessing. And, um, I don't know, probably like three weeks later, I hadn't even told anybody except Bill. I was, I'm very private and I hate, I don't know what this is, but I hate for people to worry about me. Mm -hmm. I've always been that way. So I didn't tell anybody. I have three sons and um, it was before Easter. I was driving in my car down the highway and I kept praying for the right decision. What's the right thing for me? And all of a sudden it hit me. Do you want to be here or go through life with the risk of stuff happening again? And it was like a light went off or something. I heard little angels or whatever it was. And so I called her from the car. I used my phone. My my not. I didn't drive illegally. <laughs> I used my handset and um, headset. And I called the nurse navigator and I said, I know what I want to do. And from that point on, everything took off. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we went through genetic testing um, or the genetic, what is that thing where you try to find out where it's from? What, I guess it's genetic testing or counseling. Yeah, yeah genetic counseling. Yeah. Yeah. Normally you go through if you're going to choose pro prophylactic surgeries, right? Preventative okay. surgeries. They normally do counseling along with that to it's like like you said there it, it's not always an easy decision to come to mm -mm. right it isn't it's so personal and people will often even call reach out to me and say karen what should i do and mm. i could never tell anybody what to do i can tell you my experience you know it's helpful here that lynn is sharing her experience it's through hearing other people's experiences i think is so helpful in helping us to decide what feels right for us and there is no right there is no wrong we make the best decision we can in that moment yep. is what i believe i and do I, too Sorry. And I think that, no i think that's what you came to yeah yeah, and it was strange. <clears throat> Once I made the decision for the surgery, at least, it was like the weight lifted off. And it was just, I don't know, it just felt so good to come to a decision that I was 1000% behind. And I felt my future was bright because I'm not going to have this tissue that could get infected. So, so I was really at peace with that. Um, so I remember telling my kids, I had written notes because I wanted to, um, I didn't want to scare them, but I wanted to tell them the whole truth. So I kind of waited until I sort of knew more yeah. about what to anticipate, what's going to happen, you know, da, da, da. <clears throat> and so um, that was a hard, hard meeting or whatever you want to call it. It was the day before Easter because I wanted to celebrate Easter separately. Mm -hmm. And I, we don't get together all the time, but probably twice or three times a month and I just wanted to have that behind us. So, you know, that went okay. There were tears and there were hugs and there was confidence in that what I decided was right. And they were great. And you know, then you start, you know, getting, you start rolling through it all. 
um, yeah, it, and it's, uh, <laughs> it can be tough. Do you want to pause here and ask me something? I think I feel like I'm talking so much. I You're good. <laughs> good. Yeah. Right. But I think that, you know, what, what I would love to know, because I think many of us, I mean, I, I think one of the hardest things that I've recognized and I hear often from others is it's this waiting period, right? You, you get a piece of information, but you don't get enough. <sighs> And have to wait and then you get more and then you have to wait and for me it's that waiting time can be so incredibly difficult but what what ended up being your you decided to do the double mastectomy what else was was part of your treatment plan and everybody's treatment plan is different and it's important to recognize that and it could just be the order of things is different too right. and i think where we 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 get to trust in our medical team. Absolutely. And I think that that is so important um, that you ask all the questions you need to. You get the answers that you feel resonate with you. And if you don't get them from one doctor, you find another one. And right. you keep going until you find what resonates with you. So what ended up happening for you, Lynn, after your double mastectomy? Okay. I was fortunate to get amazing recommendations. Like the breast surgeon was sort of just given to me by the radiologist that called me and said, you have cancer. And I looked her up. She had, I mean, she'd been around for a while. And so I thought, okay, let's try this. I don't know where else to go. And I fell in love with her immediately. Um, and I just... It was a leap of faith, I guess, right? A leap of faith, because you don't know really who they are until you work with them. But she was just wonderful, just wonderful. And then she recommended, well, let's let's go back. I, I had the surgery. And one of the decisions you make is, are you going, what are you going to do after your breasts are gone? Are you going to stay flat? Are you going to have reconstruction? Um you know, there's a lot of things to think about, which can eat you up. Uh, so I talked with her about the aesthetic flat closure. And I was on the cusp of that. I really was. And then I went and talked. Well, then we talked about um, implants. And I met the plastic surgeon who I totally fell in love with as well. And I just really prayed about it and thought, what, what do I think I want to do? So the end I had implant, I had a reconstruct or a double mastectomy with reconstruction. So, you know, they stick those uh, tissue expanders in your skin starts to expand. And I just felt like I had armor on, right. And it, <laughs> it wasn't uncomfortable. Um, but my surgery was June 2nd. And uh, things were going well. I did not, it was uh, stage 1A, okay? So I didn't need chemo. I didn't need radiation. And I thought, like I had um, skated through with virtually no problem. Um, and I felt kind of guilty because I knew other breast cancer patients that had so much stuff. Like my friend... Um, that actually turned me on to you, Karen. I have so much gratitude toward her because she did. But uh, she had radiation, she had chemo, and it was horrible. And I was going through this like, geez, this is, I mean, I'm not making a joke. I felt like it, this was a breeze. I could go through surgery and get the implants and life would go on. Well, um, because I'm BRCA2, I decided to have a hysterectomy because my kids are all grown. That was just a safe bet for me. So, um, you know, as you have this surgery, you're on pain meds, right? Oh, eh. for a little while. And I didn't really want to take them long. So I didn't, but I noticed that, okay, this is going to get personal, <laughs> but I had, I thought I had a major case of hemorrhoids. I'm like, oh my gosh, I've never had them before. So I called my surgeon and she said, take this, not my breast surgeon, my, um, my gynecological, I guess that's what you call her. It's the one that was going to do my hysterectomy. Yeah. Um, she goes, I want you to take this, this, and this. And this was like um, 
a month before my hysterectomy surgery. And she goes, get this and get that taken care of. Um, and they didn't go away. They just didn't go away. And a week before my surgery, I called her and I said, I am in severe pain. And I was just about crying. I couldn't sit. I couldn't hardly walk. It was like, what is going on? And on September 12th, I had the hysterectomy. And uh, I woke up to find out that I had a second cancer. I had a rare um, colorectal cancer that did need chemo, that did need um, radiation. And it sucked. It was awful. And at that point, I thought, okay, there's a lesson to be learned here. Thank God for my breast cancer. Thank God for the BRCA. Thank God for the hysterectomy because now I can take care of this cancer. And that was like within two months, it was like, oh God. <laughs> so um, I'm giving you a hug, by the way. Oh, I, I need just, it. I, well, yeah, I know. And I, I'm, I'm like doing this, like a, a, a wishing I could send it to you right now. Because, yeah. Oh. Um, and, and I just want to say to anybody that's watching this, before Lynn and I started talking, I said to her, please just go as far as you're called to go right which is always something that I say to anybody and I just I want to I just want to give you a hug <laughs> I'm you're not it. you're not in this alone and I think that what you're sharing Lynn is is so valuable for others to know um and to be aware right just it's that awareness just hearing your story and and how you even had this discomfort prior to the hysterectomy, how it wasn't related to the hysterectomy. There was actually something else going on, but go as far as you're called here. <laughs> no, seriously, you know, I mean that. So I do. I'm giving you a hug and thank you. I know it's, as we tell our story so much where we're, we're living it. Yeah, we are. Our emotions and yeah. how we, yeah. Um, I remember my sisters coming over and they all, oh, I finally did tell my sisters. That's part of it too. I didn't tell anybody. Uh, very few friends, very, very close friends. Um, my sisters, uh, my husband's family. But that was pretty much it. I'm just, I don't know. I just didn't want to share it with anybody. Not that I was embarrassed or anything. It was just like, they got enough to worry about, right? I'm going to, I'm going to do okay. So when I had that surgery and I looked to my right and there's my sweet surgeon who did the hysterectomy, she goes, Oh, everything's went well. And you know, you're kind of in this ozone, right? Cause you're <laughs> still fog, yeah. right. But when she told me the news, I don't know if any, if you've ever dry cried, but I could not cry. Like tears didn't come out of my eyes, but I felt like I was sobbing. Oh. And yeah, because I guess the tears, I don't even know, the anesthesia must dry up or something because I was bawling, but no tears. And she just gave me the biggest hug. <clears throat> and so that started a whole new journey, Karen, that um, now I can really, really empathize and feel what breast cancer, a lot of breast cancer patients go through. They went through the same hell that I did, the chemo, the radiation. Um, so I had uh, six weeks of radiation and I took home one of those uh, chemo portable things that push it through your body 24 seven for seven days. I did that twice. And at first I thought, okay, this isn't that bad, but it was I'm not gonna lie it, it it's surprising I thought I I could just get through this I got a lot of strength I've got a lot of I don't know I just kind of wanted to go you know. yes yeah. but it did get the best of me and my sweet husband again came to my rescue my sister took me to almost every appointment she moved here about a year before I did and that's why she came I'm, I mean, before I did, before I got diagnosed. And now I know that's why she came here. She was my, my little delivery angel. 
um, <clears throat> we used to tease each other. She'd call me, okay, Miss Daisy, I'm going to drive you. <laughs> Um, but it got so low where I had to call the radiologist. I said, I cannot come in. Actually, Bill called. I was just so sick. And then, you know, when you're done with your treatment, they kind of warn you, at least with mine, it, they said, y you, it's still in your body. It's going to be in your body for a while and it may get worse before it gets better. And she was right. She was right. Christmas was probably Christmas Eve or day, I can't even remember, one of those days was my lowest. Um, it was my lowest. It was, ugh. but as the time went on, I got good news. They didn't take any lymph nodes out of my armpits. Um, they biopsied one sentinel. That was great news. And my cancer, my colorectal cancer had cleared up, um, had gone away. And so now it's, uh, what month is this? September, September. And uh, I am so grateful for everything I went through. I thank God for getting cancer. And I know people are like, oh my gosh, that's insane. But I do because um, it made me aware of, uh, oh God, of the beauty of life and what your body can go through and recover. And I've met some ladies that have had the same colorectal cancer that I have, of course, breast cancer survivors. And uh, they're not my family. And we have overcome so much. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry. We've overcome so much. For crying in my oh. world, you know that. <laughs> no, <laughs> so I have got tissues right here as well. <laughs> yeah, you let those tears come. <laughs> well, I've learned so much about me, yeah. and and um, what my faith means to me. And I'm not some crazy holy roller, holy roller. I'm just, I just believe in a higher power that took care of me. And I had so much faith, Karen, that. All those bad days I had were for a reason, um, but I'm a better person. I wasn't a bad person. <laughs> I don't want to say that, but I'm uh, um, I'm just more in tune with life and with people and with the big picture. I'm calm. I'm grateful. Mm. And then my best friend brought me to you, which I can't even, we'll be on the phone forever if I talk about that. I know you want to go there because I do too. <laughs> well, yeah. I, you know, I was so, so when you first, so when your best friend directed you to me, right. And yep. you found out about me, you found out about Thrivership School, my, my <laughs> amazing group coaching program. Um, what? specifically were you looking for help with or maybe you didn't even know you just know knew that something needed to shift what were you feeling at that point in time it was February <clears throat> and she had said hey I got this uh I don't I even know how she found out about you but she goes you might want to listen to this and she had had breast cancer a year before so she's like a year ahead of me <clears throat> and so um I don't really know what I was looking for, to be honest. I, I, I don't know, Karen. When I first talked with you, I knew, I just knew in my heart that whatever it was you and I were going to go through, it was supposed to happen. I was supposed to talk with you. Um, and we have talked. <laughs> Yeah, but it's incredible and wonderful and, and amazing. So do you remember what you were struggling with at that mm, point? Strength. Oh my gosh. I was begging for strength and energy. It mm. was almost like a clock. And I don't know if this, I know one of the breast cancer ladies that I met <clears throat> at my plastic surgeon's office. That's a whole other really cool story. Um, she said the same thing. It's like you get up in the morning slowly 
And you might do a couple of things, you might not, but by almost on the dot, four o'clock, I was toast. I was toast and I had to lay down and then I was going to sleep or bed at 6 p.m. And I thought, oh my gosh, if this is what the future is, you know, I don't want to sleep my life away. So I think that was what was going through my head. I wanted my level of energy to be back. I always have had a lot of energy and uh, it was killing me mentally that I I literally didn't have the strength beyond four o'clock in the afternoon for a long time, like probably for four months, five months. Yeah. And what you're talking about is not uncommon. So if you're watching this, you're probably here shaking your head like, like I am because this is what you're explaining. And, and I, what, did you get any information from your doctors that said it's likely that this is how you're going to feel? You know, they were pretty good at sharing information with me. I never felt like I was out of the loop, but specifically, they never said your body will run out of energy during the day. They did say that that your energy takes the longest to come back. Okay. And she had told me that we're looking at probably a good six months after my last treatment, which was in December, on December 12th. So I knew I had to go, you know, for the first six months of the year feeling kind of crummy, but I didn't want to wait that long. (laughs) (laughs) Nobody does. No. Yeah. So so when, so you're, you're there, you're feeling like you've got this thought, this can't be my life from now on kind of thing. Right. Because we're, we're waiting. It's almost like we're waiting to wake up one morning and magically just feel like ourselves again. Right. And it's, we're just hoping and praying that that is going to happen. And it doesn't, it doesn't. And I know I was not prepared and many are not. It sounds like you had some, and my medical team was amazing, but they didn't tell me that. So at this point, you've found me through your friend. You're recognizing what you're going through and saying, I don't know kind of what to do from here. Like, where do I go? What do I do What now kind of thing? And what hesitations, if any, did you have about working together? I remember one very specific question that you asked me. I don't know if you remember it. And you said, you said, Karen, I'm not going to put you on the spot. Don't no, worry. go ahead. <laughs> you said, Karen, I don't know if you're real. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Right. Which yes. was, which was like, and I didn't question it because we, we, we do this virtually. I mean, it's very hard in this virtual world. And so I remember putting you in touch with Beth, one of our existing members in Thrivership School and saying, go chat. Yep. Um, so what was what was giving you that hesitation there what was it that made you say that can you recall in some way yeah well because the world is so wacky right now and there's a lot of people that aren't nice people and they do bad things and I was really wanting to reassure myself that this wasn't a scam (laughs) (laughs) at all (laughs) I didn't blame you for that it's like okay I get that. Like, you can't touch me. You don't right. know that I actually <laughs> exist. Um, so yeah. I completely understand it. And, and But it was the first time somebody had said that to me. And I said, you know what? That's a good question. I think I would probably <laughs> feel the same way if that were me on the other end of the, you know, the call. So, so why did you say yes to you and, join, and decided to join us inside private ship school? That's a great question. Again, it was a leap of faith. You and I had a really good conversation, the very first one. Um, I just felt peace coming out of you and the calmness coming out of you. And I wanted that. And um, I just knew it was the right decision. I just knew it, Karen. I knew it. And it, it has been. Oh my gosh. 
<laughs> so let's get into that a little bit. Yeah. Share. Um, what has changed for you so far? Now, I know that the first month in Thrivership School, and by the way, for those of you watching, Thrivership School can be either a six month or a 12 month program. You get to choose. Um, but the transformation that we offer is not something that can be done in a month or two months. This is a lifelong transformation. And so it takes some time, right, to sit into it. But I know the first month for you was <clears throat> completely turned things around. But if you can share a little, what's changed for you so far? That's a big question because there big are question. a lot of answers. Yeah, um, <laughs> really. Um, Tell people about that first month. Let's start there. What happened in that first month? I learned who I am. Mm. Um, really, not just, oh, I am a whatever, you know, employee of or a retired person of. Um, I learned who I am, who I really, truly am deep down. And and I learned there's, I don't know, I just, I learned to trust you so much. Um, I just felt really in a safe place. I felt peace. I felt love. I wasn't alone. Um, I was just in a really good spot with the other ladies in the thrivership school i fell in love with them too um it was a good place that i hadn't been in a long time mm. and i think for some people they've never actually been to that place right because yeah. i think that like you were saying so often i think in life we wear these labels we're wife we're mom we're employee we're this we're that you know taxi driver cleaner right. <laughs> whatever all of the labels but who's lynn underneath all of that and to me that's one of the biggest opportunities that breast cancer or any other cancer can afford us or any other trauma for that matter by the way yeah or you that opportunity to look inside and say who am i now because we, it does shift, it does change. Yeah. And I know, I just remember having a conversation with you about how that first month just catapulted yeah. things for you. And what, what has that, in knowing who you are, what has that shifted for you in other areas of your life? Every area. Every area. I... Um... <sighs> I appreciate tiny little things that might have been missed. And what I mean by that is, this is gonna sound so weird, but like when I see a butterfly or when I look at a beautiful flower, um, that is who I am. A part of me is nature. And my faith got stronger because that's a huge part of who I am. and. I, um, I give thanks every day for something as beautiful as the blue moon we just had, right? Gorgeous moon. I hope you've seen it. it did. Um, I appreciate every single person on this planet. <laughs> it's so strange. Like I, I, um, everybody, I don't know. We're just all one we're all the same. We're all the same. And the sad thing is some people don't believe that. And I always did, but that made it even better for me. I, I want to help people now. I feel empowered and knowledgeable to help people now. I started volunteering for this meal group, uh, this group that provides meals for uh, cancer survivors and People that have, and I'm going to get this word wrong. Is it metastatic? Metastatic. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so they have a different journey. Yeah. Um, 
it just made me a better person, Karen, all the way around. And I wasn't bad to start. I loved people. I loved all this stuff, but I didn't really, didn't really understand how important all that was before this, before this whole thing. Yeah. yeah. Perspective shifts. Right? Yeah, it big, does. In a big way. And the journey through thrivership school is about getting to know who you are, taking care of you. Yeah. Because uh, I know that something that is common amongst, I think, all of us in Thrivership School, and it's a bond. The, the, just like you were describing, Lynn, there, there's such a bond, a safety in this group. This is why I talk to everybody before we come in, right? Because I want to make sure it's the right fit for everybody that comes in and for everybody in there. Like, I, I'm the mama bear. Yeah. <laughs> For sure, because it's so special and so unique. Um, but I know something that's so common amongst everybody in there is that you've readily focused your energy your entire life on taking care of everybody else. Yep. And let me ask you a really important question because you're learning as you're going through the, the system, the, the formula that we have in Thrivership School. Do you feel guilty now? for taking care of you? No. And I don't feel guilty now saying no. Good. That was, oh my gosh, that was the hardest thing for me <laughs> to say ever, ever. I'd say, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. And then I'd be mad that I was helping somebody or doing whatever. And now I just really, really like, love who I am. <laughs> I... I'm honest with myself mm -hmm. um, and I'm more honest with people. They probably, I know they like that better. I have no problem saying can't do it. Mm, no, but you know, here's a solution or I don't even offer solutions, you know, mm. right. I, I, um, yeah, I, I don't putting me first was weird. Very weird. <laughs> It's a shift, you know, you love yeah. it. And this is the thing, and I get it because I, I'm a, I say I'm a recovering people pleaser and a recovering perfectionist. Yes. I think that these are characteristics that so many of us have, and, and I'm included in this, right? That I unlearned, and it's a big part of what I teach in Thrivership School because, I, I mean, to hear you just say with such honesty, I love who I am we're not just saying it because we think it's the right thing to say or right. say it I know that this is because again it's part of what we teach right it's the process of what you go through is getting honest with yourself without judgment and that's something I say a lot yeah. right without judgment we look at things with observation with curiosity so that we can learn and grow and I think you've embraced every step of it so far. And I know you'll continue to do that. What do you believe? And you kind of said it a little bit before. What do you believe is possible for you now? Anything. <laughs> Anything. Yeah. Um, I learned that we are all given one body. And <clears throat> sometimes it hurts sometimes it feels great but we can get through anything mm -hmm. we can get through anything um i've learned to forgive myself Ooh. yeah that's a huge thing huge because early on i i remember I don't know, like drop something. Who, who even knows? You drop something and you're like, oh, you're such an idiot. What'd you just do? You know, you talk to yourself and I don't do that anymore. I don't think I do that anymore. Or if I do, I'm very conscious. Like, whoa, That's I didn't mean to say that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I have all of this, all of this because of you, really, because of what you teach people, what you show them as possible. Um. <clears throat> Yeah, I am such a better person than I was in the beginning years ago. I'm I'm just better because of you. 
And I'm not better at doing things. I mean, not bad. I'm just saying I'm a better human. <laughs> How did it feel to let go? We 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 have names for that negative voice in Thrivership School. Yeah. We 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 gave her a name. So um we call her negative Nancy with no disrespect to anybody Nancy at all. But it allows us to have humor in the situation, right? I mean, it just lightens it. How has that felt? Because I think that's something that so many of us have played with, right? Mm -hmm. How has that felt to not have that so prominent, not have Nancy hanging out as much as she was in your head before? How has that felt to let, let Nancy go? Yeah, it's... um. It's hard to describe because it's it's freeing. Mm. It's real. It's um, lighter. It's nicer. You know, we we all do things that oh, I wish I didn't do, or I wish I did. You know, whatever. But I just don't have her squawking in my head. And if I hear, I'm just like, get away, get away. And then I immediately think of something positive. Like I try to turn it around because we have another funny little character. We do. <laughs> I wish you didn't realize we have fun in Thrive Ship School. Right. This is serious life altering <laughs> stuff that we learn, but we make <laughs> fun as we possibly can because yeah. we all need that levity. We all need that humor in our life. And it helps when we're talking about really serious, difficult things right so go ahead name the other <laughs> that we have <laughs> oh positive she's so funny wait positive negative nancy positive oh my god i'm pulling a blank oh, it's okay positive pamela pamela you know what that's my sister's name shame on me <laughs> okay <laughs> you better edit that <laughs> Positive Pamela. Yes. That's a couple interview. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Both ways. I hear Pam in real life and I hear positive Pamela in my head. <laughs> well, um, yeah. It not, is not in a toxic way mm -hmm. or a ridiculous way, but it's a realistic. This and this is the thing too, right? We're not telling ourselves, suck it up. We're not saying, we're not trying to hide what we're right. feeling, but we're recognizing that if we can change our thoughts, we can change our feelings and our actions and our results. And that's the power of it. Yep. For sure. So true. So true. Yeah. So what do you think? <laughs> and this might be a, this might be a tough question based on what you've already said. But what do you think has been the best part of Thrivership School so far? Okay. Been a lot of them, let me tell you. Um, it's it's going to change your life. It, it changed mine. It's probably two things. Can I have two things? <laughs> okay. Um, finding out who I am. To answer the question, who are you, was, like you said, and like I said, that was brilliant. It was so good to really give it some thought. And the other thing was the peace and calmness that I have now over cancer, over anything, um, the breath work, I guess that's three things, but the calmness that I can go, I can have, or that I walk around with now, you and I are both BRCA and there it comes with a lot of risks, but I don't let that, I don't let that take over my life. It's, I can't control it. I cannot control it. So I focus on what I can control. And um, I'm just different now, Karen. I'm so at peace, so calm, not afraid of the future. Bring it on, you know? Um, it's 
I'm just in such a better mental place and I'm still recovering. Don't get me wrong. I, um, I am what eight months out from my last treatment. Uh, but learning from you how to deal with things that come up, you know, random things, little things, big things, and how to think through things or, you know, the calmness is knowing who I am and the calmness. Those are my two biggest okay. things. Yeah. Well, huge things. Yeah. That makes my heart so happy. <laughs> Really, no, she really does because the system works. And you're about five months in, Lynn, to Thrive a Ship School. Yeah. Yeah. We haven't yeah. gone through a full first six months yet. Right. And you're already experiencing this complete transformation. And it's for anybody that's watching. Right. Did you ever wonder about, well, am I going to have the energy to do the program or how much time is it going to take? Or am I going to struggle to keep up? Were those ever thoughts that you kind of had in the beginning? Yes. Um, I did have that. And we're not, right, we, you know, when most people come to meet me, we're exhausted. So right. those are real thoughts to have. Right. Right. Yeah. And I can say that Karen makes this, you make this as, um, I don't know, easy is, it seems so wrong to say, because it is easy, but it's, it's it, the only work that there is really is for you to start practicing what she teaches you. That's really the work. And if you don't put energy into that, and I could see it might take a little time, but I embrace this because right away, I, I, like you said, the first month, I was like, oh my gosh, what a difference. Yeah. Um, there's no homework, you know, there's nothing like that at all. It's really listening to what Karen is teaching you <laughs> and um, starting to practice it, starting to discover that and you have to be honest with yourself you can lie all you want oh yeah this is working or this but then it's not going to really work you really have to listen to what she's saying and be honest with yourself yeah um to to get the answers you need so you know what to do when you need those skills that makes sense to use it does skills. it does because i think that here's the thing i think that we can and we're not saying that anybody is dishonest out there. And we're not right. saying that dishonest before, but I know through my own, and this was part of my own personal growth journey too. We get so caught up in thinking about what we should be and who we should right. be else and what we should be doing and all of those things that we actually don't know what our own thoughts are underneath all of that. Yep. And a big part of this program is like you said, having that honesty check, that reality check to say, well, what about me? What about me? Because, you know, I think that that's a big part of what breast cancer or other traumas teach us is that we matter too. Mm -hmm. And if we're not going to put energy into our health, be it mental, physical, or emotional, we, you know, we talk about holistic health. Yep. Nothing's going to change. Nothing's going to change. And like you said, Lynn, I, I really sat, I've been creating Thrivership School over a 10 year period of working with people one-on-one -on -one and really thought about how I can make it as simple as possible. And I believe that we've achieved that. Mm -hmm. The results that not only Lynn, but people, um, other people in the class are getting. So it's just amazing. Um, I'm yeah. proud, proud of it and I'm proud to see you and everybody else like embracing it and and doing the work, having those honest conversations with yourself. And that we also provide this safe container for you to ask questions, right? I'm not just teaching. There's a lot of interaction right. in our workshopping classes, in our coaching calls, so that you get to 
get those questions asked and you get coaching um, over the areas where we get stuck because we all mm -hmm. get stuck. That's okay too. Right. Um, so is there anything else that you would like to share with anybody that's maybe considering Thrivership School saying, <clears throat> what would you like to say to them? First, I want to say thank you to you in front of whoever sees this, because um, you are amazing. And I'm not saying that. <laughs> it sounds so funny. You are, Karen. You, <clears throat> she knows her stuff. I mean, this isn't magic. It's not magic. It's just, well, she's gone through it, right? She knows where we all um, have been. And you just, I encourage anyone that's struggling with whatever, any kind of trauma, to just call her, talk to her. Karen, I knew that you were the right person from the minute I started talking to you. Um, go with your gut, you guys, because it's just, it's changed my life. And of course we changed because we all, you know, went through some kind of trauma. So we're not the same person, but now I'm not the same person again for the better. <laughs> and for the better, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So um, you're not alone. Don't do this by, by yourself. Um, How do your husband and, and boys think about the transformation that you've experienced how does how has it impacted your relationship with all of them they saw me um they see me and saw me handle all this adversity with such grace and i know that they used to tell me that i'm like <laughs> sure but now i kind of believe it you know i i started thinking about what you were sharing with us and it just put me on a whole different plane. Like, like I had this superpower <laughs> within me um, to heal and recover, just not physically, but mentally. And um, they have said they've noticed it. They're proud of me. <clears throat> um, and I'm proud of myself. Really, I just have never said that out loud, but <laughs> but I am uh, because of things that you've shared with us. And I don't know, Karen, it's just, they just appreciate, I think they've never met you, but they appreciate you <laughs> because of what they see me go, have gone through. So, that right. Um, but that, that's, that's the beauty this this work is about you learning who you are but it's the opposite of selfish because just like you shared what your close family members are seeing in you the joy that you get to experience together again right right, right. Having life again you're in it you're not just like on the sidelines watching it yeah and that is such a huge gift to be able to give and to see you receive and it's we all sometimes have a hard time receiving things yeah we do but we get to receive in thrivership school and in the receiving I know that you end up going out there and sharing it to the world and and, and people that you touch including your husband and your boys there's a ripple effect from this yeah. it's not just about you it goes so much further so that's interesting you say that because I think I've said this to you before I find myself <clears throat> even with complete strangers <laughs> saying things that 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 you have said or thoughts that you've put in my head um I want to share one real quick thing real quick um we talk about um helping others and what this has done for me it's given me courage to help you to help others, courage to, uh, just confidence within myself, I guess is the right word. And I was in that plastic surgeon's office on my very last, it was the pre-op 
before the final surgery. And there was a woman that walked in with her son <clears throat> and uh, I could tell she was in big time stress. She was just, you know, you could just tell her face. And when he left the room, I walked over to her and I just said, it's going to be okay. That's very strange for me to say, but I did. And we still now talk to each other. She is a breast cancer survivor. And I find myself saying things to her that I have either learned or heard or from the group, you know, that we, we hang with. And um, so it does, it keeps on giving and giving and giving and giving. And you are awesome, Karen. You are. Awesome. You're, an a, you're an angel. <laughs> you're an angel. Thank you. That really means so much. You mean so much. This this group, Thrivership School, is is my heart and soul. It truly is. Like it's it's been such an honor to get to create a sacred the sacred space that we have yeah. because we really do. And you know, if what we're talking about today is resonating with you, like Lynn said, just, just let's have a chat. You'll, you'll know the same way that I will know whether it's a good fit for you or not. And if it's not, don't worry, there are other programs. I've got a million other coaches that I can recommend if I am not the good fit, but just don't struggle. Don't right. struggle. There is help out there. Um, and I don't know. Thank you for doing this. I know it was uncomfortable for you. Yes, it was. <laughs> and we're still recording. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, but I love the goofiness, right? We get to be silly and goofy in this very serious world. So, Lynn, I, again, thank you so much. Sincerely, yeah. thank you for sharing your story, being open, vulnerable, having the courage. Um, because this, I know that this will resonate with other people and like I said if you're watching let's have a chat cup of tea cup of tea in a chat that's all it takes right so well, I'm, I'm honored to do this to talk with you any chance I can get I love talking with you <laughs> um yeah you're just amazing and for anybody that's watching this just call her look her up on her website give it a shot um, yeah, she has a lot of special things to share and it'll make you feel better. Yeah. We're ending on that note. I love you. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. Love you. Love you too. <laughs>